Beck Lover. Welcome to another episode of the Beck Lover Podcast, where you might learn a thing or two about life. You never know who we're going to bring on or where the conversation is going to go. And today, I got a very interesting character in the house. I got my man, Eric Zulegger. This is a dude that's lived many lifetimes, and he's still young as hell. He's an author uh, with a very interesting book coming out called... You Are Not Here, Travels Through Countries That Don't Exist. You Are Not Here, Travel Through Countries That Do Not Exist. And unfortunately, one of those places that's probably in your book is a place that my family comes from, which is the Republic of Kosovo. And we'll get to that, also known as Kosovo. Yeah. We'll get to that in, in a little bit. But Eric is a fascinating individual. And when he reached out to me, I had to bring him on the show. So I want to thank you for coming in here today. And Mir uh, Sevian. Merci, Jetta. So, Eric, you are American. I am, yeah, yeah. Born and raised. Born and raised. I'm from California. Zulegger, what kind of name is that? From what we know, it's, uh, I mean, the the last newspaper article that we have of, like, great-great-grandpa Zulegger goes to the Austrian-Hungarian Empire. So, so I was right. It was somewhat Germanic. Yeah, exactly. Zulegger! Yep. I it. Achtung! It sounds better if you yell it, yeah. Totally. So, <laughs> you're from where in the U.S.? I'm from Redondo Beach, California. Family goes okay, back there a couple a generations. Nice place, bro. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. California went to hell, but it's a beautiful place to uh, to live. I, I think I may be one of the only people that has uh, has taken the trip to uh, move from Los Angeles to Toronto, Albania. But uh, I, I really uh, don't regret my choices at all. So you actually live in Toronto, Albania. This yeah. is your residence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How I, long have um, you been living there? About two years in Toronto, uh, but all together, uh, first came to Albania for in 2011 as a Peace Corps volunteer. So back in the day, America, when you were going to the Peace Corps, they'd kind of just throw a dart at a map. And then my dart hit Albania. Didn't know much about the country. And then uh, off I went to uh, to Tripoya and uh, lived for about two and a half years there as a, as a high school teacher and uh, did some other projects. Ran a mobile library. All right, you said a lot there. So let's, <laughs> let's, let's, let's process some of this. All right. First off, explain to people what the Peace Corps is. Like, I, you know, I, I understand it's like this group that kind of goes all over the world, but like, first of all, where is the headquarters of the Peace Corps? I mean, what is the Peace Corps? Yeah, so the Peace Corps is kind of like uh, the opposite of the American Army. Uh, it's basically like if you want to do some kind of government service, uh, you can sign up to spend 27, ye or 27 years, 27 months of your life volunteering in a developing country or an emerging economy. Is it an organization or is it a government agency? It's a part of the State Department. So uh, whereas the military is part of the Department of Defense, Peace Corps is a part of the State Department. So we provide, I mean, depends on the country, right? So in Albania, we were working, I want to say, like three sectors. So we had people in community development. They were working at like Bashkia's. Uh, we had people in health sector, and then my sector was teaching. So basically, I was a volunteer, you know, high school teacher. And then now you're finished with college when you entered the Peace Corps, or you're doing it during college? Finished, yeah. Came Is out that of a college. requirement, or I mean, no. so how old can you be to go into the Peace Corps? There's no upper age limit. You can. We got some some real old folks in the Peace Corps. How do you sustain when do they give you like a stipend or how does that work? It's a stipend at pretty low subsistence level. So I got like three hundred dollars a month. Wow. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you're living like an Albanian at that point. I mean, that's the goal, right? It's it's kind of to uh, not they only put you up though. You have a place to live when you're there. Like you, have you get you get a landlord kind of set up for you, and then you you pay the landlord. So I mean, you know, the the pay is very low. You have to pay with that 300? Yeah. Are you serious? Yeah, yeah. So how the hell did you survive in Albania, bro? Oh, man, didn't eat a lot of meat. <laughs> wow, bro. Yeah. You literally lived, and I hate to say it, but you lived even maybe at a lower standard than an Albanian would because they have places to live. Yeah. They, you know, the average salary is between two and 400 bucks a month. That's right, yeah. So you're getting 300 and you got to pay rent. That's right. Yeah, and you're yeah. American. Yeah, yeah. From a nice place in California. It was, it was a culture shock to say the least. And I was in Tripoya too and they have winter. And yeah, and we're going to get to that in a yeah, second. Yeah, yeah. What the hell makes you want to go and do this? Oh, I mean, honestly, I kind of thought this was like the best possible deal. Like I had wanted to, to go to another country, but not just be a tourist. I wanted to do something in that country. Wanted to learn another language. 
Um, but you didn't choose Albania. The Peace Corps chose it for you. Yeah. Could have been, I think they operate in 120 countries. Honestly, what was your first thoughts when they said, you're going to Albania? I looked it up on a map. Oh. Seriously? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Did yeah. You, you didn't know much about Albania, did you? No, not a, not what a were thing. Your, and remember, you know, we all have perceptions before reality sets in. What were your first thoughts of what an Albanian might be like or what living in Albania might be like? Did, were your, was your family thinking, where the hell are you? I mean, what, what was that like when they said you're going to Albania? Well, so, I mean, I was a writer before I left for Albania. So my answer to everything is just research the hell out of it. And so as soon as I found out about Albania, I was like, I've never, I don't think I've ever met an Albanian before. We don't have a huge Albanian population in California. Um, so it's growing. Yeah, it you is. Know, we've penetrated really heavy right now with some of the most amazing talent in the world from Dua Lipa to Ava Max yep. to, uh, you know, BB Rexa, which by the way, yeah, the, shout out to, to her after what happened. Uh, what last night? I think if it would have been anyone else, any other pop singer that got hit like that, I don't think she would have got up as quickly. Yeah. And she even waved to the crowd as her face is bleeding three stitches. How do you throw a cell phone at, Anybody, first of all, let alone a woman, you're yeah. a man, right? And you're at her concert. I mean, it's just disgusting. I mean, it's it, it's a testament to how strong Albanian women are, and it, and it's it's so noticeable when you're in the country. Who's your favorite Albanian singer? Albanian or do singer? You like them all? Fat no, American ones. Oh, I was thinking Fatmir Berchani. Well, I knew you were going to say that <laughs> if you spend time in Topoia. <laughs> I gotta say that somebody will, somebody will kill me if I don't. She's one of the greats of uh, Albanian, basically like folk and opera. Yeah, basically. yeah. I, I know her village. Sings. I it was was quite so, quite close where I lived. You find out you're going to Albania. Yeah. You don't know nothing about Albania. No. You'd seen the movie Taken by this time. God, so this is 2011. Taken must have come out, yeah. I believe it was already out. Yeah. So, you know, my family's from Tropoya. I know, yeah. And from what I understand, even my father. So my mother's side is legendary in right. Tropoya. Um, my great-great-grandfather, I'm sure you saw the statue. Mm -hmm. Ali Iber Nezai was the general of the Legion of Prizren. Mm -hmm. His statue stands in Tropoya. But uh, also, from what I understand, my father's side crossed over and settled in uh, Kosovo, I'm assuming because of the name change, my, my real last name uh, is supposed to be Betucci, if I'm mm -hmm. not mistaken. Betucci is, yeah, a, uh, is my, a beautiful village in, in um, uh, but, uh, Tropoya. You know, I'm thinking with the name change, there was probably some blood war somewhere mm -hmm. during some time, and whoever that was must have went into Kos you know, the Kosovo side of Albania and uh, settled there, maybe. You know, it's, you know, those mountains, you know, are like borders. They really clans are. Clans and family. So... You got stationed in Tropoya, or they told you, do you want to go there? So we event, so the way that, that Peace Corps kind of works is you go uh, and you do three months of training. And usually it's in a sort of like uh, a training site. So I was in Librajd originally. Um, and the goal of that was just, you know, get as much language under your belt as possible uh, mm -hmm. before you go to your site, which is going to be your home for two years. And you don't know what your site is going to be in those three months. The, the staff is just kind of watching you. See how you do as a teacher. See how you do with the language, and then they they choose the people to to go to whichever site. Um, but Tripoya, specifically Byram Surrey, was one that they were just opening up. As you know, it's it's sort of politically contentious. There's some uh, there's some some dangerous elements there, and it's also uh, you know weather wise, it's just a hard place to live in. I mean, you know, for those that have no idea where Albania is, let's start with. It's north of Greece, south of Serbia, and it is east across the Adriatic Sea from Italy. Yeah. It is one of the most ancient countries in not only Europe, but the world. Would you agree? Absolutely. Would you agree that most people don't know really how rich the Albanian history is? Oh, it's incredible. And now that you speak our language, and we'll get to that in a little bit, but Tripoya is in one of the most rugged parts of all of Albania. It's high in altitude. Yeah. It's up in very rugged mountains, also known as the Cursed Mountains. Yep, yep. Right? Biesta Namuna. Yep. Right? Mm-hmm. And the people that come from there generally are very, very tall. Super tall. Like giant almost. Yeah, which was really hard as a high school teacher because I was looking up at all my students. <laughs> is it? Do, why do you think the people? Do you think it's genetically because we're from those mountains? Do you think people that live in mountains are generally gravitate towards height? I mean, why do you think the average person 
from Tripoya, Albania. They are. Very, I'm one of the shortest people in my family. Some of my cousins are like six five. Six, I feel like six. a child every time I go to visit. I'm like, what? The, how did people get like this? Like ancient Illyrian warriors, basically. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, one of the things that that I because I ended up going to to study and work in geopolitics a little bit after after my Peace Corps service. I you know wrote internationally. Um, uh, so I was, you know, covering stuff in, in the Middle East and Central Europe. Um, and one of the things that, that occurred to me when I came back to Albania, I was looking at the, uh, uh, the paintings in the National Gallery, and I noticed that in uh, some of the, uh, the Soviet realist paintings, people are always pointing their guns down. Nobody's pointing their guns up. And I was like, well, why would that be? And it's like, well, because they're always fighting in the mountains. You know, there's a reason that there's this not only many cultural microclimates in Albania, because, of course, the dialects change dramatically, you know, a couple hundred kilometers from one city to the next. You're speaking a totally different language. But there's a reason that the Turks couldn't hold the land. It's it's so full of mountains. It's so full of I'm rivers. Like, I've, you know, I hate to use this analogy. I mean, I don't hate to use it, but I feel almost like we're like the Afghanis of Europe. I mean, I, I don't think it's an, an inappropriate Very analogy. mountainous terrain, yeah. always in a state of war. Super hard to hold. Always being attacked. Mm -hmm. Very rugged, very strong, very tough people who, for the most part, most part, from what I understand, when it comes to honor, they're willing to die. Yeah, I mean, that's that's one of the things that I thought was was a huge takeaway from living in Albania is, you know, as you know, you... you grew up in america and so so you know uh, america yeah. yeah you know american culture and you know albanian culture and so as an american who came into albanian culture there were so many gifts that came from learning about this this ancient culture right and one of the biggest ones is the honor culture right um collectivist culture uh because as an american you're you're sort of on your own and and you're uh you know pulling yourself up by your bootstraps whatever cliche you want to use there um but along with that i think oftentimes comes with a certain amount of caginess and paranoia that that underlies a lot of the cultural tensions in our country but albania always has something that is is greater than in their country or in their in their culture it's the the family is greater than the the social unit is greater than i mean the the amount of of patriotism that albanians have it feels like it comes directly up from the roots right it comes directly up from the land you know it, it may be an impoverished country in some places but there's so much pride and there's so much respect for for each family there that it's it was I tried to take as much of that on board as I lived in the country, and I, it changed me dramatically. And that's so that's you end up in one of the most rugged parts of our nation. Yeah, you end up with one of the more, I would say, holding on to the ancient ways, probably you know a lot more than other areas of Albania and Kosovo. These people are up in the mountains. Yeah, they're set in their ways. They're kind of in their own world up there. What was it like? What was your reception like with the Albanians of Tropoya? <laughs> well, I'll, I'll tell you. I mean, I didn't speak the the, the language nearly well enough uh, at the very beginning, and um, I th there was some problem like with my apartment. My apartment was basically a shed, um, so you know, I, I I locked my door with like a padlock and a key to like get in and out of my house. But eventually, they they gave me you know my shed to live in. And uh, I walked up one day, and there was uh, there was a guy slaughtering a goat on my doorstep. Uh, I didn't realize this is sort of a hugely honorable act. I was just like, "Oh my God, I wish you could do that somewhere else." Um, <laughs> I didn't. I'm, I'm well, just trying so to. So you get wake it. up and there's a guy cutting a goat right on your doorstep. Uh, yeah. Well, so it was. I was trying to get back into my house, like I was just going shopping or whatever, and dude's like, uh, you know, uh, slaughtering a goat on my doorstep, and you know, it's like a. It's. That's was a, it for you to have? It dinner was. Or it was a. It was a kurban. Um, so it was like. Uh, uh, so it wasn't like, oh, let me just use this guy's stairs. It was like, no, no they were doing the sacrifice sacrifice and they want to have a nice dinner yeah 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 and you know meat is a luxury especially in those areas that's right i i had um so i taught in a bunch of different i ta taught in the uh the high school there uh gymnasas and volkshi and then i decided that i wanted to go out in the villages too because as i mean as you know village life in in albania is dramatically different than the the cities um it's the ancient way man. it's incredible it's absolutely incredible it's, you know it hasn't changed much i mean it has with technology a little bit here and there but as far as like 
the day-to-day life. I would say it's one of the probably still authentic places left in all of Europe. I was, uh, I was, I'm trying to convince my uh, my cousins here in New York to come come visit, uh, and I was just saying, you know, if you go. 30 minutes outside of any major city center there, you can find the medieval times. You know, you, you find people who are, are still farming ancestral land and who are still... Uh, generation after generation. It's remarkable, yeah. And, um, I mean, like, but then that there's also so much ingenuity that comes from that, too. I had a, I had a student, you know, he lived in, uh, I can't remember which village, but it was, it was pretty far out, even from Byram, Surrey. So it's like maybe 45 minutes. So he'd take, take the bus in every day. And he showed me how he had like hacked together a wireless router just with a, you know, old block cell phone. And so he was getting internet reception out in his village where they didn't have any sort of like connection to the outside world. Maybe Elon Musk can send us some Starlink. I mean, yeah, he, they could probably use it over yeah. there. <laughs> what is your perception now that you've lived a few years in Albania? What is your true, honest opinion? of Albanian hospitality, first of all, and just in general, all of us, whether they're from Tripoya, whether they're from Saranda, whether they're from Kosovo, you've had experience with all Albanians, correct? Yeah, oh yeah, definitely. What is your general conception of the Albanian nation? Oh, I mean, you know, there's a reason that I live there still. Um, and there, you want to live, like you're done with your Peace Corps stuff? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, I've so been done with Peace Corps for residence. 10 years, you've, yeah. You've turned, you've turned your back on America. I have. <laughs> and, and, you know, joking around, but you've you've taken residence. Yeah. And, you know, the irony there is, I'm sure you've heard it many times too. A lot of Albanians, when I go over there back home, you know, how do I get a visa? Right. How do I come to America? Yeah. And here you are, not even an Albanian. Yeah. You're an American, born and raised. You lived in a really nice place. Redondo Beach is beautiful. Yeah, it's great. Okay. And you decide to go live in Albania. When they're trying to leave, mm. you're there. Yeah. You want to be there. So what would you say to the Albanian who wants to flee and leave their lands to come to America or Germany or whatever? Why have you chosen to leave what their dream of is to go to America and make money and why did you choose? Well, I, I actually, this I, life. that's a great question. I think that, that there's, I don't think I'm ever in a position to tell somebody that their dream isn't what it should be. You know, I think I, it's more materialistic, but I don't think people understand what you give up when you leave your homeland. Yeah. I, I, I think you that's know, accurate. I've always flipped the question on them. How do I make this place so that maybe one day I can return or and, my kids can return. And there are, that's the thing that I find really exciting. And, you know, people, People in Toronto will, you know, will will complain about about how things haven't advanced enough yet. But you see incredible things happening there. And it changes. I mean, you know, I'll leave the country for a month and there will be, you know, uh, new art galleries, new bars, new so restaurants. I was there in 95 and 96. Oh, you got to come back. Okay. No, no. I've been oh, many okay. times. And for them to say there hasn't been any development, I mean, just look up. Right. There was no buildings. Everything was like small. They're building high rises. They just built a stadium. You know, that's down the street from me. Yeah, they're they're moving in the right direction. The food and the cuisine in, in, in the capital and, and along the coastline has come light years compared to where it was. So there is a lot of great progress, but the same problem still exists. Very high unemployment, right? Very low wages. And, and also, you know, a the thing that I've been really inspired by, right, is that there is this sort of there's this groundswell of you know we're gonna do it ourselves we're gonna make startups we're gonna you know interact with the the wider world and we're gonna make our mark while we're staying in the country you know one of my one of my dear friends out there uh, uh Lorena Jana she is uh she started the first video game studio in Albania first indie indie game studio so it's, you know two two Albanian women we're creating a video game studio and stuff. So like streaming, one. streaming while they play games? They're, no, no. They're they're like literally developing from the ground oh, up making games. games. Yeah. That's awesome. It's incredible. And it's out of Laprock, you know? Where like, is Laprock? It's like a suburb of Toronto, you know? And and you see things like that every day. You see, uh, I was having a conversation with a bar owner out here and he was he was sort of talking about, uh, no, out in, in Albania. Um, and he was talking about how he wants to make sure that when 
they are starting bars when they're starting great experiences uh, down in the South, which, as you know, is getting super commercialized right now. Cruise that, ships are going through there. Right. Uh, Tourism is exploding every year, which I'm a little sad about. I'm happy for the economy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I don't want... I feel the same way. The natural... It's the last place in Europe that has the most beautiful beaches. Yeah. Right? I mean, have you ever seen beaches like that? No. They're untouched. Yeah. And it's literally like... Like they say, Europe's last secret, right? Yeah. It's like the last place. And now everyone the with solid the TikTokers branding. and all these fucking travel people. Yeah. Come to Albania, come to Albania. And people realize we're not crazy like everyone says we are. We're not evil. Did you, you know, there's danger in every country. Yeah. yeah Have yeah. you ever really felt that in danger when you visited Albania? No, I mean, you know, that's what I tell everybody. I'm like, you you have to try to get in trouble in Albania. I, you know, I've... I've Wandered around. Yeah, basically, all don't, that. don't fuck with their daughters. Don't fuck with their girlfriends. Don't fuck with their wives. Uh, and and also, or if like, you fuck with their daughters, you better be serious and marry them. Also, carry a <laughs> stick uh, if you're walking in the forest because those dogs are just motherfuckers. <laughs> I've been chased by too many dogs in that. Country. I mean, pretty much as long as you don't cross, like I believe, traditional conservative values, like you don't mess with someone's sister. Yeah. You don't mess with their daughter. Yeah. It doesn't mean you can't date them or talk to them. It just means be respectful. Yeah. Have honor. Well, it's a small community and it's a small country too, so quick. everybody knows everybody. And and that's, you know. Would you say, what would you say as far as to Americans that are listening to this show? The Albanian people, are they people that respect America, love America? I mean, what's your perception now living in the country for many years? Are Albanians pro-America? Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they're they're the... I think they're the most pro-American country that I've ever been to. On the face of the planet, would you not agree? And I've been to about 47, I mean, uh, 50 countries, something like that. So is it safe to say that Albanians are probably, if not the most, pro-American people on the face of the planet? Mm, I mean, even more so than many Americans sometimes, yeah. Okay, the American flag is seen many places. Yeah, they absolutely. They have statues named after U.S. presidents. I mean, Woodrow Wilson. Roads. Yeah, well, there's a, Shashi Woodrow Wilson is down the street from me. Um, got a George W. Bush statue. I mean, you know, part of that, though. And Americans understand that, we, you know, right now we're very divided as a nation. Mm. We don't know that, you know, the Albanians don't know the difference between a Republican, Democrat, liberal, mm. conservative. They don't know our politics. When they have these statues, because people are like, well, um, I hated what Bush did, so why do they have a statue of Bush? Or I yeah. hate Bill Clinton. Like, they don't, the Albanians don't care about the politics. They don't know right. what's going on. They don't see CNN every day and C-SPAN to understand how the political climate is in our country. When they build these monuments, they're building it only for one purpose, to respect and say thank you to America for the support it has always shown the Albanian people, starting with Woodrow Wilson all the way up to the present. Well, and, and this, I, I think this is also a bit of a double-edged sword, too. It's like, you know, I've been living in Albania on and off for, like, almost a decade now, right? And it's like, I want I want people to treat me, and they do, you know, based upon the, the merit of my character rather than what my passport says. Um, and I, I think that there there are when Americans... Uh, sometimes, you know, when uh, when the, the digital nomads come through here, they're like, oh, well, it's so pro-American. And they use that as uh, an ability to, you know, have some cultural leeway to, to act in a bit of more of a disrespectful manner where they wouldn't act that way. At, I've back witnessed at it home. many times in my travels throughout Europe. Like when I was in Rome, you know, I saw a lot of Americans drunk and acting, you know, belligerent in the streets it's not a good look for us right? yeah and i mean this is this is the thing that that has always you know sort of bothered me is like and it goes with with every culture really um it's having this sort of uh ignorant oftentimes violent minority which which makes the outer edge of the stereotype for everybody else in it you know yeah, the, just don't act like a karen basically <laughs> yeah. when you go to another country karens turn it off yeah please please do so um, and and I think that there's a there's a benefit to doing that too because if you're able to you know let uh, try to meet you know I have a Croatian uncle and before I left for Albania um, you know he's he's an immigrant to to the U S uh, married my aunt and uh, and you know he's part of the family now and and the best piece of advice he gave me was he said you know just do your best to try and meet people halfway and if you do that. Anybody in the Balkans is going to be falling all over themselves to to connect with you and to help you and and that you know that that advice is responsible for why I still live there why I still love not only Albania but the region in general not to mention that I mean it's great food nice people cool history so 
do you come often back, you know, home here to the States? I kind of do like once a year trip type of thing. Has any, has any of your family visited you? Oh man, we've, we've, we've gone full adopted Albanian. Like, I mean, really? So like my, uh, my family comes over a bunch. My mom started learning the language a little oh, bit. She like it. Oh, she loves it. Yeah. They, they've come over a couple different times. My, my dad is a, so he's a judge in, uh, uh LA Superior. And so he did a, uh, uh, did like a Fulbright, uh, uh, like professional leadership thing with the, uh, court system, the court system there. Yeah, so my like, my brother did something similar. Yeah, Close teaching about. teaching anti corruption. Um, he was thinking about doing, um, uh, you know, working with the ULEX uh, processes up in up in Kosovo, but he didn't really want to do that. He wanted to spend more time in Albania. Um, my mom's an author, so she wrote a book that that is all about Albania. Uh, she writes thrillers, but but there's a whole Albanian subplot in there. Shout out to Rebecca Forster. That's her, her so pen they, name. So they they like Albania though. Oh yeah, we just had their 45th wedding anniversary in the uh, the castle in Peza. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah. And my mom was like, "So uh, they like it." So then you went first, yeah. And now they've seen it, they've experienced it, and they they like it. As, oh, they fucking love it! Yeah, absolutely. Would they ever live there? Would they retire there? It's a lot cheaper to retire there. I know it. I know. I'm you trying get to get pension, them. You get your pension. You live in Albania. You live like a rock star. Bro. I know. I know. I'm trying to trying to get them to spend more time Five, over. Five ten grand a month. You're living like a king. It's pretty it's pretty For good. Now. Yeah, For yeah. Now. I know. We'll see what the what the coast does. <clears throat> so, have you also had experience in? Um, Republic of Kosovo. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I lived in um, uh, in Kosovo for about two months. Also, Pristina is the the biggest town nearest to uh, so to describe, Baramsari. Describe Kosovo to non Albanians. What is it? Where is it? What is it? Your yeah, perception of what it is. So, uh, so Kosovo, and actually Kosovo was the inspiration for my uh, uh, for my book, uh, right? And uh, was, it's north of Albania. It's north of Albania. Many Albanians consider it a part of Albania. Yep. You're talking yeah. to one who does. Shipri mouth, yeah. Ethnic Albania, which our version of events, we were all under the Ottoman Empire for a very long time. Correct. That's Ottoman Turkey, for those of you that haven't read a history book in a long time. Yeah, yeah. They controlled that part of Europe all the way up to the Caucasus for about 500 to 600 years. Yep. There really was no borders and boundaries. And when the Ottoman Empire collapsed in 1912, mm -hmm. it was basically a land grab from all these different ethnicities and... I mean, it really seems like it appears that we got the short end of the stick there. I mean, is that yeah, accurate so, to what you think? Or, 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 you know, some of these other countries like Serbia claim, you know, we all moved into Kosovo because of communism. I mean, what is your perception on it? Not to offend anyone, but you've been living there for years yeah. now. Some might say you might be more biased towards the Albanians because yeah. you like us. But there is a lot of similarities in all of our cultures. Yeah. To neglect that would be a lie. Our food is very similar. Our music is very similar. Um, I would say we have much more in common than we don't, except for our language. And these traditional, you know, hatred towards one another, I think is getting really old. And as someone that lost a lot of family in the Kosovo War, you know, I don't put all Serbians in one basket. I don't brush them with one stroke. And I hope they, they think the same way too. I think for the first time in history, we all have similar enemies. Poverty. I'm not a big fan of globalism. I think that a lot of the people in power in all those countries have been put into power by maybe forces from outside, and we don't need to get into all of that today. But I think if we woke up, we would realize that this fighting has got none of us anywhere. Right. It's why our countries are still poor. It's why more people are leaving our countries. And theirs too. Well, especially Kosovo okay. too, which has a declining population. So even if we have... A flag and all this freedom if everyone's leaving then what the hell's the point right. so what is your perception your book is kind of about this yeah the book and was inspired by kosovo so say the name of the book again and yeah kinda, you know get into what it was like to live in kosovo mm -hmm. what's your perception what do you think the biggest problem albanians are facing um over the next 10 to 20 years well so the the book started out because i was living near kosovo for this entire time uh, uh during my peace corps service and i had the chance to go to the five-year anniversary of kosovo uh so that was what uh 2012 i want to say and so at the same time was the hundred year anniversary of albania independence yeah yeah and so it, you know obviously huge party throughout the entire region uh for the albanian speaking population and um you know, is that five years of independence for Kosovo? And it just kind of dawned on me that countries aren't, you know, forever. They they get made. 
they are born and sometimes they die and they turn into something else. And I guess I just never really considered that before. As an American, you know, you, you sort of wake up thinking that, that, well, your country's always been there and it's always going to be there. And, you know, you're, you're sort of impervious to, to the fluctuations of geopolitics. Uh, but I would think it's the opposite as an American. I didn't really gather that from our history. I gathered that we fucking came in here, wiped out the locals and, and, and started a country. I think when, when, uh, you know, as a, as a, somebody who's just graduated college, but I would say someone that doesn't really go too deep into it at first and really think about how rich history can be as an American. Yeah. 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 We kind of show things only from our perspective. Yeah, I mean, Very this was watered down. Totally, we're the good guys always. Yep. Fucking, we're you know, we were taming the uncivilized savages. You know, it was very watered down. Yeah, whatever, whatever. Uh, 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 at least 20, 30 years ago, I can only imagine now what history books look like in schools. Today. Yeah, but whatever. I get what you're saying. I'm just. But whatever branding you want to put on it, and it's like, and and you know, you you sort of have this this understanding that's like, well, I am a part of of you know strength and empire, and and why isn't everybody else like that in the the you know sort of worst reading of the American character that that's somewhere in there, I think. We're going to bring you some democracy. Right, yeah, and it usually comes in the form of a missile. Um, and, and, and then... then McDonald's to follow it. <laughs> the building that they just took out. That's right. Yeah, I, I, I was in uh, uh, Iraqi Kurdistan for my, uh, my the first chapter of the book. Uh, so I saw their referendum on independence and I was shocked at how many KFCs they have in Iraqi Kurdistan. Tons so of maybe KFC is really Kurdistani fried chicken. <sighs> I, you know, I never asked anybody. Curdy fried chicken. I got, I got. A, we I have got. KFC in Kosovo too. Now, like the original. Oh, do you? But they don't make it like we make it here. They don't. They only have like, from what I understood, it was like, it might have come a little bit longer. But I was there when they first brought KFC. Yeah. In, which I was kind of happy about. Yeah. No, the first thing you, you see, King, first thing I was you see happy about that too. Uh, as soon as you you leave the airport in Toronto now, KFC first thing you see. And you know, again, but it it's, doesn't have like the biscuit that we have and all. Like it's very, it's variated. I'll be honest, man. I you like have it no, no. I I have not eaten KFC in the states. I've only eaten it in Albania. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, regarding the Kosovo thing, um, so it it was mind blowing to me that that you know a country is just made, and then you can and be. You, but what's mind boggling for those that don't understand the, the paradigm here? Yeah, if that makes sense. Is that we are exactly the same people. Divided by a border that the world imposed on us. That if you ask the majority of Albanians, I know the majority of Albanians would rather just be unified already. It makes no sense for us to be two people that are supposedly democratic. Dushtetnikamp. Yeah. Two different. It, there's no, no other people in the world have this. Mm. This is another thing that makes the Albanians special. You know, you have North and South Korea. One's a totalitarian state. One is capitalist. But no, we have two people that are exactly the same. You know, speak the same language, some variations. But we understand each other, brother. Yeah, the dialects are different, but I understand the Southerners. Yeah, I might not understand all their words, but we can have a very good conversation and understand each other. You know, I would give it the equivalency of maybe, you know, someone in New York speaking to somebody in, uh, you know, the, the the sticks in Texas. Yeah, know? yeah, yeah. And they're using their their lingo, but you know, nowhere else in the world do you have two people separated by a, a border that the world imposed on them that are both capitalist, both a free society. And they want to be. They want to be united. Yeah, this is this is a, a bit very, of the very weird the uh, what they call the economic peace theory, right? Um, so the idea, or sometimes they call it, um, uh, it, it's kind of a tongue tongue in cheek thing, but the idea of uh, of McDonald's peace theory and the idea that it, essentially, if you and they tried this in the Balkans, um, they meaning you know larger transnational bodies, um, but basically saying, look, if we economically integrate countries that that have had violence in their past as you know if we economically integrate them in a mutually beneficial way they're not going to go back to war with one another and so it sort of boiled down into you know what if we have two countries that that previously had conflict in the past and they both have a mcdonald's they're never going to go to war with one another of course this was disproven in uh when uh, russia went into georgia um but you know the the difference with albania and kosovo is that they are economically similar. Um, they could benefit one another uh, in terms of, of... Access to the sea. Correct. They both speak the same language. They're the same freaking people. Brother. But, 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 but I, I think, think what really when we talk about this situation, we yeah. have to talk about not Kosovo and Albania, the Albanians mm. and their neighbors. Right. 
And for those that don't know, you know, Kosovo was a part of the former Yugoslavia. Mm. Yugoslavia was functioning at one point. It was not that bad of a place to live. Right. There was always ethnic tension there. We had autonomy under Tito, which was like the man that ran Yugoslavia. Yeah. Right? And really the problems between us and the Serbians escalated once Milosevic came into power. He stripped away the little self-rule that we had. And it was a brutal crackdown. And I always make this argument to, you know, when I sit down for a cup of coffee with a Serbian, I say, listen, you guys forget. We weren't asking for independence. When, when Milosevic stripped our rights, we were asking for those rights to be restored. Well, and they were... They it were was only after the brutal crackdowns, years and years of civil disobedience. This is all documented. They could sit here and argue this until the moon turns green mm. or yellow. Yeah. Which it does sometimes, but, you know, it turns... If there's whatever. fires in Canada, yeah. Yeah, so <laughs> you can argue it all you want, but this is all documented. It's yeah. all on video. It's all on YouTube. It's all... You could say whatever you want, propaganda, schmopaganda. The truth of the matter is, if you ask most Albanians, they lived a good life under Tito. Mm. They will admit that. There's plenty of videos of him on YouTube. They're waving the flags. They're cheering him on because they did have an economic, you know, decent life at that time. They had cars. They had jobs. Albania was in a very dark form of communism, probably one of the worst in the world, if not the worst. Truly, it was the yeah. most isolated country ever, yeah, yeah. even worse than North Korea. You wouldn't have had Dennis Rodman playing basketball with the dictator of Albania. They would have shot him in his head. Yeah, though that would be a pretty okay. weird image, wouldn't it? Yeah, so, <laughs> you know, you know, as bad as North Korea is, I'm not trying to lie, it's right, horrible. Right, yeah. But you wouldn't have ever even had an outsider in to show the people, you know, right. look, this guy's from America, he plays basketball. So what I think we're, you know, these arguments go back and forth. We're all stuck in the past. Mm. It's happened. I lost 30 people in my family. I will never forget what happened to my family. Mm. And it's hard to to ever feel good about that. But I know we can find a way if we stop listening to the bullshit of our leaders, if we focus on our own countries at first. I guarantee you if we can find a way. No one's stopping Serbians to come see their sites. They can come. No. But when you don't recognize the people that live there, mm and you hate them, and you fuel into this whole medieval thing of this is where we started. Well, you know, there's every action has a reaction. Mm. You do a brutal you do a brutal crackdown. You strip people of their rights, their dignity. I witnessed it firsthand. I traveled back every summer. Yeah. Okay, I saw what my family went through. I was terrified to go there. I was scared to get off the freaking plane. Yeah. Okay, and then the war started. You did what you did. You, you didn't just do it to us. You did it with the Bosnians. You, so... You've been hostile to a lot of your neighbors, and I'm not saying it's the Serbian people that wanted that. Their government at that time initiated these conflicts. Sometimes I would even beg maybe it was done by other powers to break up that country. Mm. Okay, that's really my theory. Okay, that some exterior forces pressured this guy to... Nothing he did made sense for his people mm. at all. You know, it, it's interesting when, as I was sort of going between each of these these unrecognized nations, there, there was a similar... There was a similar theme that came up, and and one of the things that I noticed. Did you was, spend time in Serbia? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I've definitely spent. So some you've time. spent time with everyone in that region. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I I think more salient to this point though is uh, the time I spent in uh, in Kurdistan too, right? So there's a similar there's a similar um, let's say dictatorial move that happened in in Kurdistan, right? I mean, they really got screwed throughout history. Absolutely. They yeah. Have no no land at all, which is disaster for those people. Yeah, and and so there's the uh you know uh the oil producing region, the major oil producing region in in Iraq, Kirkuk, right? So there is according to Saddam Hussein far too many Kurds on that land. So he needed to arabize the area. So what did he do? He poison gas. Uh well, that was the end game definitely. But before that, it was, okay, well, now you can't speak your language in this area. Now you can't run your institutions in Kurdish. And this was similar to what happened in Kosovo, too. It's like, well... Am you, I exaggerating? I mean, listen, you're, you're American. Not, no, you no. didn't give a shit about Albanians before you went there. You've lived in the region. I'm not picking on them. No, you're not. Okay, these are people that... Mur My family's dead today. I have 30 people on the ground in a village called Hurric in Kosovo. I think I'm being very open-minded here and very fair these conflicts are not benefiting them or us. Yeah. It's keeping us in a perpetual stalemate. None of us are prospering. Our youth are leaving and fleeing. Well, it's, it's like, let's just get over this already. Let's like, we recognize each other. Mm. Let's move forward. I guarantee you in 10, 20 years, nobody's bothering you. I guess that's the question though. And this is something that, that, that seems to be a persistent question in a lot of these areas, right? Why is moving on so difficult, right? 
And and I mean, I've you know, I've never been displaced, right? I've I've talked with people and I've interviewed people who have been. I've I've spent a lot of time in areas of diaspora and spent a lot of time in areas that have been absolutely, you know, destroyed by genocide and and internal conflict and and historical conflict that goes back to the middle ages i mean that's you know that's the story of course the answer to this so so why is it so hard to do what you're talking about why am i not mad at all why why do i not group all the serbians together and say they're all about Mm. first and foremost they had state-run television Mm -hmm. b92 you're only being shown albanians are terrorists albanians are this albanians are blowing up the police station you're not being shown what so if you lived in serbia during that time of the conflict, it's just like right now, Ukraine. I really don't know what's going on in Ukraine. Mm. I know that they're fighting Russia. What really started it? I don't know. I know I support the Ukrainians' right to self-determination, but I don't think any of us can really say we're experts on what's going on there and what's really happening on the ground. If you lived in, you know, if you lived in Serbia during that time, you're only going to see what the state-run television tells you. They didn't show you the 10, 20 years that they were beating the living fucking daylights at everyone who were peacefully protesting, type it in. Go on YouTube, type in Demonstrata, right? D-O-D-E-M-O-N-S-T-R-A-T-A. Type this in on YouTube, Kosovo, and look at the videos. Since the 80s, peaceful demonstrations yeah. for their rights, for a better economic situation, never asking for independence. Mm. The independence came once the Bosnian Wars and all this shit went to hell and Yugoslavia collapsed. They're like, well, everyone else is declaring it. We should declare it and... You know, but we still didn't bear arms. We stayed out of that conflict. We avoided war as much as we could. Really, until would you agree? End. Yes or no? Oh no, no, definitely, definitely. So you know, I mean, the it, I I think so. Yeah. One of the one of the things I write in the book is is that basically there's this sort of recipe towards you know getting getting an insurgency and then a civil war and then and oftentimes a genocide, and it's like stop people from speaking their language. Stop people from being able to run their institutions. Um, there was mass firings when he took over. They were thrown out of the institutions. They weren't allowed to self-govern. They had no police that they were their own. It was only Serbian military police. You were fined. You were beat. You were arrested. Just for the, I've seen it many times when I was there. Mm. They came into my uncle's store, got rest of soul, just put a padlock on it, took all the money out of the register. I mean, they, they don't know. That's why I'm not mad at the Serbians. They lived up in Belgrade. They lived up wherever they lived. They saw only what the news showed them. They didn't get to see the other side. But if you live in the West or anywhere outside where you were not exposed to propaganda, because I would say the same thing's happening to our people here. I want to give the correlation. Mm, of course. You know, if all you watch is mainstream media, and if you don't figure it out by now that they play games with what we're seeing, we're always, looked, we're always made to look like we're the good guy. Mm. I didn't agree with the Iraq war. I never once said we should go. Did I like Saddam Hussein? Absolutely not. Who put him in power mm-hmm. is what I'll say. Yeah, who put him in power? We we haven't met many uh, uh, theocrats that we didn't didn't really like so long as they got along with us. So is it safe to say that we had a lot to do with probably why he was in power at one point? I mean, did oh, we yeah. arm him against Iran? And sure, certainly. So, as someone that has to look, you have to look at the whole picture. Mm. And we are one global family. Right. We are one human family. And I agree with you. This tribalism is toxic at times. You know, I take things from the spiritual perspective. I really do believe in God. I believe that we're all the children of Adam. I believe God could have made us all one people if he wanted. Mm -hmm. I think he made us into different people and races and colors to see how stupid we're really going to be. How dumb are we going to let these little differences to make us kill our own brothers and our own sisters? Well, I think there's there's a a really really compelling point in there, and I think it relates back to what we were talking about, about, you know, why, why is it so hard? to say, you know, past was past and now we're over it. Like one of the things that that I noticed, especially in the Balkans, is like you have history that goes back to, I mean, you know, let's say the Battle of Kosovo, like 1389, right? And you talk to a Serb, you talk to... And the Battle of Kosovo is when the Serbians yeah, so went to war with the Turks, but was it only Serbians that fought in that war? No, it was... It, uh, so it was the, a coalition, uh, was it not? It was a coalition. Um, and how do you, I mean, how is it, how do we know you're telling the truth? Uh, well, the, the Serbs would say it, um, you know, it was, it was under, uh, Prince, uh, Prince Lazar, uh, and he was able to sort of cobble together this force of, of Albanians, Bulgars, uh, Serbians, uh, so it wasn't just even them that, Macedonians. So it Greeks. wasn't just them that fought there. It was everyone 
uniting to try to push the Ottomans out. Yeah, I mean, and and so this is this is exact. This is a great way of. Are there any books that you can recommend or anything off the top of your head? That Balkan Ghosts. Read? Balkan Ghosts is a great one. Um, Do you know who the author is? I don't know who the author is. Because oh. I always say, you know, it's important to know where you get information from. Yeah, Balkan Ghosts. Is someone can be biased, about it. so you know, you just read a book and assume, okay, this is the truth. That's something people people read a book. I read it in a book. Mm. Yeah, well, who wrote the book? Yeah. You know, it's fair to say if an Albanian wrote a version of the history, he would be a little more biased towards the Albanians. If a yeah. Serbian wrote it, he would be more biased to the Serbs. I've always appreciated history from people that are not, you know, either or. So I think with with Balkan history especially and uh, and with learning about history, where you learn about history from is like the the question is like how, how does a story, and this is something that I, I think about constantly, uh, living in the Balkans and also given the, the research of my book, is like a country really happens when you when you start having a story that's married to the land in some way, right? Where you convince somebody that, or you convince a group of people that that between these lines that are made up, there is one story that exists, and if you disagree with that, then there's going to be some kind of problem, right? And so they say that that uh, creating a country, statecraft is all about the art of generating consent amongst the governed. And so places like Kosovo exist because there's no more land left. So if you are self-determining on the same land that I say is mine, well, normally there'd be no problem. But since you self-determining takes away a portion of the land that I say is mine, suddenly it's not you self-determining, it's you taking land from me. It's you changing the story that's already married to my land. And at that point, that's when violence happens, right? When when two cultures are trying to agree on one set of truth and there is a vast difference between them. I'd say the greatest example would be probably Israel and Palestine. Yeah, it, it certainly comes the up a lot. The sad thing is they have a lot in common. They're technically cousins ethnically, right? Mm. If you believe the whole lineage of Abraham, peace be upon him, the prophet. And that is a conflict I don't see ending well ever for either side. But, you know, that's why, like, I've always appreciated history from people that are not from, you know, as long as they're not biased and they're being fair and they're doing the research and they're not of either ethnicity and they're giving their true, honest observation of why they think this conflict happened, where it came from, how it went about, who really was the aggressor, you know, well, I mean, this was this was something that I, I also had to really check myself with when going into Kosovo. I mean, uh, look, I've been at, at, at you know, the five-year anniversary of Kosovo, the 10-year anniversary of Kosovo, and just recently the 15-year anniversary of Kosovo. I live in Albania. I'm an American. Um, and so I have every reason to have a great amount of bias towards, you know... Uh, I, would, I would argue that on behalf of the Serbs. Uh, yeah, and and so b- because of that, I had to go and seek out Serbian voices. I had to seek out... Because, you know, there's seven stars in the, the Kosovar flag, and each one represents one of the ethnicities that exists within Kosovo. And one of the things that I was noticing as I began doing my research there, I was, I was like, well this is only an Albanian story. And then I was like, no, that's not necessarily the case, right? Because when those lines were drawn, that meant that, you, like you say, the Serbian holy sites are there. You have Gracenica, you have um, uh, where the Battle of Kosovo was. You have all of these Serbian sites, and that's the messy part of statecraft. So I had to go and talk with those people and be like, you know, what, what does this mean to you? You know, Independence Day is coming up. What does it mean for for uh, one of the guys who appears in the book as um, a docent at the uh, the um, the monastery in Gracenica? So uh, Gracenica is a an old uh, Serbian Orthodox monastery, been around since the Byzantine Empire, um, and uh, so you know, with Independence Day coming up, what does what does this mean to him? And what I was struck by with it when I when I spoke with him. Um, and initially, you know, he asked me where I'm from, and I, I said USA because I never lie about where I'm from, um, even if that that could benefit me in some way. I just don't think it's 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 great journalistically or or even as a traveler. I don't think it's the most ethical thing to do. Um, and so he kind of shrugged me off a bit, but then uh, we ended up talking a little bit about uh, about the Bible because there was, you know, in that monastery there's this uh, there's this painting of the Last Judgment, and it's I mean it's pretty remarkable painting from the middle ages 
And I noticed that uh, there was somebody in uh, the sort of like Garden of Eden area that I didn't recognize. You know, it's like, okay, that's Moses. That's Abraham. uh, That's Christ. And so just trying to make conversation with the guy so I could, you know, ask him some questions. Um, I was like, who's, who's this saint here? Um, and he was like, you know, the, the, um, the other thief that was crucified on the side of Christ. And fortunately, my buddy Dave, I went to Catholic school, um, he, he took the name of that thief as his confirmation name. So I was like, it's St. Dismas. And suddenly a guy opens up to me a little bit and, and we start chatting. And, uh, you know, you can't have a conversation in a Serbian monastery in Kosovo without talking about the fact that you're in a Serbian monastery in Kosovo. It's impossible to, because the, the elephant in the room is just blowing its trunk so, so loudly. And, um, so we're sort of talking around this issue for a bit. And at one point the, the guy takes me over to the, the wall and he's like showing me these bricks in the wall. And he's like, this is a, this is a modern brick in the wall. And I was like, okay, I'm not exactly sure where we're going with this, but what's up with the modern brick? And he's like, you see how it's crumbling? And all of the bricks that are a couple hundred years old, they're, they're hanging on. It's like, yeah, I, I see that. He's like, well, that's because modern construction has forgotten something. We don't know how they made these bricks, but we know that that one isn't, you know, following suit. And I was like, well, what do you think is forgotten here? And obviously he was sort of trying to make this point about Kosovo. And, and he's like that, that essentially the old ways, what he sees as tradition, will always win out. And that, that these, these new forms of, of uh, statecraft, of, of building materials, in the case of his analogy, would eventually go away. And so, you know, I, I asked him outright, I was like, so... What you think is that that from your point of view, traditionally, you believe that Kosovo is Serbia and that Serbia will eventually sort of reclaim all of this area. It'll come back for the monastery of Gracinica. And he's like, yeah, that's exactly what I think. And, you know, from there, he kind of goes into the, the same alternate history that you would normally hear from somebody. But one of the things that I was taken by and, and I had to take really seriously is like, this is not a man who's just like blindly repeating propaganda. You know, he was he was very emotional about it. He was, he was sort of welling up as he was telling me. And like for me to say, no, that story is a lie is exactly where you you get violence, right? And like and that's exactly why we have problems as you say, forgetting and moving on because that memory is so deeply a part of somebody's identity. Where do you, where do you put your own identity? If that part of the story, like the part of the story that, that, you know, you're, you as an Albanian, you also as an American, if America goes away tomorrow, like what's your identity? I mean, I've run that. I've, I've questioned myself with that and I don't, I don't have a second ethnicity. Right. Um, and I don't know. Um, from his point of view, what he said, and I felt like this was pretty chilling, uh, especially after interviewing a lot of Kosovars was, um, he said specifically, this is halftime at the football game. It's only halftime. It's going to start up again. And it's like, you know, I'm there for, for an anniversary of, of Kosovar independence and, uh, and you know, what this man presumably wants is, is maybe a return to warfare. Um, probably not a diplomatic resolution, but you know, I I found that to be chilling. And then, you know, on the flip side of things, I go across the, uh, uh, across the way because I'm just, you know, trying to sort out my thoughts at this point. Um, because of course I'm also trying to, uh, push back against my own natural bias. Um, cause it, it, I mean, you know, uh, you're you're human as long as you're you're a journalist and you're a, a travel writer too. So it's like it's nice to be liked. So when Coast Fars are like, "Oh, you're American, we like you," it's like, well, I, I clearly have more of an affinity towards people who say they like me rather than well, Serbians are not going to be big fans of America. Oh right? yeah, absolutely not. I, I mean, your perception of how the, the majority of them or the ones that at least you interacted with towards America, um, uh, pretty nice actually. Um, the, you know, Chile at first, 
But I think that there's also a bit of a cultural difference there. I think um, uh, well, Slavic I mean, we culture. Led, we led the bombing campaign. On that right, America, exactly. So, so they're not forgetting that. No, no, certainly. I mean, there's they still bombed. They don't consider bomb- us a friend, I don't think. There's still bombed out buildings in, in, in Belgrade, which I think are kind of like monuments to aggression. Um, but, you know, I think this did you is... Go, a- did you go to Belgrade? I've been through Novi Sad, uh, briefly through Belgrade, but uh, but mostly spent my time in Novi Sad or another small village in northern Serbia called Apatine that I ended up through. Um, but, you know, I, I noticed that very different from, so I spent time in, in northern Iraq too in, in uh, the, the Kurdish region, Iraqi Kurdistan. And, of course, you meet Iraqis from all over. Um, and I think the Middle East treats people differently based on their uh, their nationality than in the Balkans, right? Which I, I, I think is, is, you know, something that we can all kind of take a lesson from. Like nobody, I don't think anybody knows better than people who live in the Middle East. And I'm, granted, I'm, I'm using a pretty broad brush there. But that they know that, that people are not their governments, you know. That, like, you know, I've, I've had tea with, with uh, Iraqi guys from, from the village that Saddam Hussein is from, incredible lovely hospitable people and there there was no moment of you know you eric zulager did this to us and there is there is an understanding of like yeah your your country did this but it's the same thing in, we know this is not you yeah so it's like the war breaks out between russia and ukraine my friend owns a place called the russian samovar mm. meanwhile they're ethnically jewish uh ukrainian and russian in origin they came to America to start their lives. This conflict breaks out across the world. It has nothing to do with them. They don't support it. They actually supported, you know, they put the Ukrainian flag on the building and people were boycotting their restaurant. And right. it's like you are judging them for a country that they they left. They came to America to live here, not to be in Russia. And they came because they were probably oppressed. A lot of Jews were oppressed during the Soviet Union. And they're paying the price for something they have nothing to do with. Right, and I always believe you have to meet people where they're at. There was many Serbians that were against the wars in the Balkans. Of course, there was atrocities all around. Um, but let's be real: some of the greatest atrocities were committed by them. There has to be a moment where you say, "This happened. I didn't agree with it. The government did it." Like I said, if you were living in their country during those times, you only saw what B ninety two showed you, which is their news station. It's the same bias we would have during 9-11. All we saw was the World Trade Center get hit and this and that. And we saw, not even Arabs, we saw Sikhs who wear turbans, who can maybe be mistaken for Middle Eastern you know, or Arab, being beaten up and even killed after 9-11. Right. And these are what happened. This is what happens when people are ignorant, when people want to group everyone into one box, and they forget they're a part of one human family. Yeah. I do believe what that monk said that we are at halftime. Mm-hmm. I do believe that Kosovo is in grave danger, especially because of what's going on in Russia and Ukraine. I do believe that there are powers that be, not just governments, who would even instigate a conflict between Albanians and Serbians to create more drama in the world, more division, uh, because the more divided we are, the more controlled we can be. I know that the only way to peace in the Balkans is for Albanians to be armed, to be trained, and I know that we will never be the aggressor. We will not be the one to invade another country. This is my opinion. Mm. Uh, I could say biased or not. Traditionally, you know, they'll claim the whole Kosovo thing. We've all lived in that region. There was no borders and boundaries for 500 years. You said you've studied the Battle of Kosovo, which is when their prince fought against the Ottoman Empire. This is their greatest, you know, story they tell in their history. But you also have come to the conclusion that they weren't the only ones that fought in that battle, right? Albanians fought, Bulgarians fought. Well, there's, there's everyone also in that region tried to resist the Ottoman Horde. And and on yes the, or no? Yeah, oh yeah, certainly. But were Albanians involved in that battle? Yeah, absolutely. Well, where do you get this information from? Oh, uh, I think that came from Balkan ghosts. Okay. Yeah, but th- this is also similar on on the other side of things too. So, uh, five hundred. And Albanians also have Orthodox. At one point, yeah. at one point, many Albanians were Orthodox. In, yeah. In religious terms. Mm-hmm. And this is another thing that I want to get into. My family was massacred by the Serbian military. 
I never once, and there's videos of Orthodox monks ble blessing these soldiers as they go into Bosnia, as they go into um. Kosovo. You know, there was many atrocities. I never once, ever once, even with video footage of some of these like monks blessing them as they go into battle, ever once did I blame Christianity for the death of my family. Mm. Because I know what Christianity teaches. Mm. I know what Islam teaches. I know what Judaism teaches. I know what Hinduism teaches. I know what every religion pretty much teaches. Well, so this that is you do not take life. You do not take the life of children and women. Even in Islam and the Quran, there's rules to battle, wars dealt with. You can never, under any circumstance, commit suicide or blow up a building with people in it. There's rules to engagement. Mm. And you know, for example, if I'm speaking about it from the Muslim perspective. It says, do not oppress and do not be oppressed. Do not transgress beyond limits. If they offer you peace, accept. So you're in battle and your enemy's like, yo, we had enough. If they offer peace, take it. If once you make peace, they break the priest, then you wipe them out. Mm -hmm. But still, not women and children. Mm. So the way we're told, these little glimpses, the same thing happened the last 20 years here in America. Mm. The Muslims are going to kill you. They're going to blow you up. This is what the religion teaches you. Chop off their heads. And meanwhile, to say that you weren't fed propaganda as an American mm. to view Arabs and Middle Easterners as very hostile people. you I've never been to Iraq. I don't mm. have the right to speak about Iraq. Mm. I'm hearing you talk about how hospitable they were. Oh, incredibly. They didn't hold a grudge against you because you're American. Yeah. We bombed the shit out of their country, led to chaos. I don't know if they would still rather be under Saddam or not. I don't know what's going on over there. I'm curious to find out. I'm sure the Kurds don't want to be. That I know. Mm. But this is where information is so powerful. Well, that, and yeah. And the only way to heal these wounds is to have these types of conversations. I wish there was a Serbian here. Mm. You know, Maybe that's something we can do one day. But I don't have a problem building a bridge. I lost family. I don't want more war. I don't want people to die. I think it's stupid that we're fighting over rocks and stones when, f you know, you know, today we think of borders as I got to go through a checkpoint, there's a passport, you know, right. I need, you know, I need, um, you know, I don't know where it is. But Your passport's right on the, the computer yeah, there. I need, I need one of these, yeah. you know, documents to cross a border. So right. it's more like, you know, in the old way, in the old days, there was no real checkpoints, you know, maybe there was some walls or whatever. But like these borders and boundaries have been changing throughout history. They're imaginary lines, and we're killing each other over this nonsense. Yeah, It was almost like I would feel like if you lived in the ancient times in Kosovo, in Albania, Serbia, you would like walk 50 feet in the other direction and not realize you're in the Serbian part of whatever. So it's like, the, you know, what bothers me is the propaganda. They want to act like we haven't existed. Your country's only existed since 1912. Yeah, that doesn't mean our people haven't. Yeah. We are, and you speak our language now. You're American that learned this language. We have existed for a very long time. They've done DNA on us. Have you studied any of this stuff? Yeah, yeah. I, I They've write done the DNA book. on the Albanians. Yeah. They our language. So why don't you maybe what yeah, you I'm happy gathered? To, I'm happy to. What do you think? Are Albanians the original inhabitants of that part there? I'm not saying that Serbians don't belong there, but who would you consider to be the oldest people in the Balkans? One of the oldest people, if not the oldest. Or what? I mean, what have you gathered in that? aspect of that part of the world that you know everyone claims alexander the great yeah. everyone claims this guy <laughs> serbians That's claim true. that skender Beu, aka george castriotti our yeah. national hero no he was really serbian sure. you're flat so these are the arguments you see i see them in my comments i get that yeah, yeah. all day over this crap what is your perception as an outsider what is the albanian language what is the albanian culture are we really just from 1912? I mean, what what is your? Well, I mean, I can I can tell you the 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 facts that my research has shown, right? And uh, you know, one of the most important factors with with Albanian uh, heritage is the language. You it's know, everything. It's, it's the, the only proof we have, and it's it's the oldest. You know, it's one of the oldest languages in the world. It's it's its own branch of the Indo-European language tree. Um, and then the fact that, uh, you, you have the Albanoi tribes, I, th I thought you said something fantastic about, about how there were multiple Albanoi tribes, right? And then, you know, you go back, I was talking to an archaeologist a little while ago. The Albanoi tribes, tribes, oh, were, yeah, what, sorry. what, what, what people are we talking of? So they would be, uh, from, uh, from my understanding anyway, they're the, uh, the Albanoi tribes are the Illyrian or the sort of free peoples of the Balkan and Peninsula. And the Illyrians were 
at one point a province of the ancient Romans. Correct. correct. Yeah, yeah. And it was called Illyrium. 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 Mm-hmm. Illyrium. Yep. However yeah, you pronounce yeah. it. So it was a province. And then there were Slavic intru- intrusions that came in came in later. When did the Slavs start arriving to the Balkans, based oh. on your research and analysis? I want to say it was around 600, and I know that's that's politically contentious. But Do you think that today the people that call themselves Albanians, are they the ancestors of the Illyrians, in your opinion? Uh, I mean, this is what I've been told by them. So um, I'm not an archaeologist, not an anthropologist. What about the language? Old as fuck. <laughs> well, what gives you that... that assumption oh well because it's it's unrelated to anything else in in the area of course there are a couple turkish words in it there's um they especially have turkish in, words too they in, say haida yeah serbians say haida yeah we all have uh, a a lot of words that we had to use because you have no choice but to deal with sure. your occupiers but as, as soon as you get up into you know the more remote areas and people are speaking you know mushroom gegnesh like the the geg dialect is is such a such an old language and it like tosk from my understanding, anyway, became the Juelatrar or like the the understood oh, so language. The full sheep in Shambuka. Great. Po po Great uh, yo, and chop say yum duke, uh, look at Pagunta, and chop say yum duke, hunger book, me dukushna, shipria, um, or shum first year put the pagoi, sep say yum hoi. He's saying that if I was in Albania, I tried to pay the bill, they wouldn't let me, yeah. But yeah, you do speak Albanian, so you have my stamp of approval. <laughs> and you do speak more of the gag dialect. <laughs> but you spend time in Tropoi. Tropoi per each mapara unisha. If you had to predict, <laughs> if you had to predict <laughs> the odds of another war between the Albanians and the Serbs, you have to bet your life on it. Mm. Do you believe there'll be another war between the Albanians and the Serbs? I don't think so. What will prevent that? <sighs> I don't think that it would be an besides iso- dialogues like this. Yeah, I, I don't think it would be an isolated conflict. Um, I think that it would be it. Would, it would probably have to be a part of a larger a larger. Well, that's conflict. what I mean. You don't think there'll be another world war? I think we. I think we're already in one. No, we I mean it's it. in, it's entirely possible that there would be another one, but it, it, I don't think that it would be it would be you know a, uh, a the nation state of Serbia versus the nation state of Albania like that. It, it would have to be a part of the larger conflict because we've created such a, a transnational world. There, are, I mean, this is this is how World War One happens. This is how World War Two happens. You have transnational relationships that activate at uh, at the point that there's aggression with within regional partnerships or multinational I mean, partnerships. Albania is Team America, let's be real. Certainly. Serbia is Team Russia. Yeah. So if Russia ends up in a world war, which I think we may very well be in the beginning of that. And certainly hope not, but yeah, possibly. I think, I think we are. Mm. I think this is going to escalate. Mm. Russia will not stop that battle. Mm. They have to win. If yeah. they lose, they lose everything. So you have two sides that can't afford to lose. You have NATO giving them trillions of dollars. You have Russia. Russia has their allies. You have the currency bricks being formed. Right. The dollars in the first time in jeopardy ever. We've never had. We've had depression. We've never had dollar collapse. Mm. When the dinar collapsed in Yugoslavia overnight, you could even buy a piece of bread. Yeah. And to think that that can't happen in the U.S. when we're just printing, 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 printing money. I've actually spent. I've spent <coughs> some some time. Actually, most recently, it was in Argentina. Where uh, where they've had they've had a currency crisis and and so you know you come with U.S. dollars and you can go to that they call it a blue market but it's the black market and go to you know a black market guy and you know suddenly a beer goes from costing four dollars to forty cents because you've you know you pot, you you traded not with the central bank of the of the country. I think this is where a lot of Americans are lacking. Mm. I think we I think if anybody's under the propaganda, it's us. Mm. We watch our TV, we watch our shows. You don't have news where you get to see a world leader speak. When's the last time we got to see Putin speak on television? I've never seen him on TV talking. Yeah, I don't think if I ever is one sentence. Mm. How the hell are we in the connected world that we are with all the technology? And I got to go and try to search for what this guy's saying. If the press is the press, how come this is not on television? How come I can't see what the leader of China is actually saying about us? If you want to talk about being controlled, we are controlled. And the information we get is fed to us through algorithms and whatnot. So for me... <clears throat> These are the correlations <clears throat> where history repeats itself, where you have censorship. You had censorship in Yugoslavia. You have it in America today. I don't care what anyone says. We have it. People are turned off. 
I don't give a shit if Trump's a good guy or a bad guy. The guy who's the president of the United States of America to not allow him to. This is where the argument comes into social media. Mm. These are the public squares now. So to turn someone off is like me being have the right to protest outside. Mm. All the debate, all the information, all the opinions are formed online. These platforms need to be marked as public utilities. Mm. Where free, in my opinion, this is how we fix the whole problem. This is how we protect democracy, protect freedom, protect the freedom of the press. These social media companies, yes, they're privately owned companies, but because of the influence they have on society, and we've seen it now, we have enough data to know what it does. Influencing voting, inf whatever it is, opinion, can create a riot or a revolution literally overnight. Mm. Because these are the public squares, free speech must be protected. I think these companies should be put in, be public utilities. This is this is an interesting point. Um, and it, it's something that I, I find super relevant um you know to the, to the art of statecraft and i think one of one of the things that you have to think about when when you're let's say you're generating country you and i are we're making our own country right now and let's say we want our country to be democratically run um you know we're we're seeing right now as as uh the U.S. is is a dominant global power, and there are the rise of other autocratic global powers. We're seeing how well democracy works, but hopefully, it continues to work. Um, that's that's certainly the American point of view. But one of the rules of thumb with democratic governance is you have to create a system and then let your enemy run it, right? So. This is one of the questions that I have when we're talking about making things public utilities, right? Because at the point that it becomes a public utility, then it is under the state's control. So, yes, it's publicly held, but it also becomes an apparatus for, this, for state control. So, great. I thought that was the best term, but what I was trying to say is, like, it, it, there needs to be a way where it's protected just like the First Amendment. Yeah, agreed, agreed. So that and wasn't it, maybe the best term. I agree with you. Once something's a utility, the government kind of runs it. Well, I think... I think these are the public squares. Now. Right, this right, is right. He's standing on a soapbox going, I'm against this. I'm against that. I'm for this. I'm for that. And if we block one side, sure, then it's only time before the other side gets blocked. And now you're in a dictatorship. Well, and I think, I think that this is a, a really, is something that I don't think that we think about enough in the States, right? Like one of the things that we'll, we'll sort of take to this, this, and, and we should, you know, this, this religious point of view is our rights, right? You know, it's a remarkable document that, that the Bill of Rights said, here are your inalienable rights. I, I think we take for granted how unusual that was in the world at the time that the Bill of Rights was written. But also, I think it's important that we take a step back from these inalienable rights and also think about with every right comes an equal and opposite responsibility. So, like, what's our responsibility that we have when we have free speech? Like, it's to you know, speak the truth as best we know it, maybe. I don't know. We can't enforce these responsibilities, but I think it's important to think about what the equal and opposite responsibility that we have for our rights is. For a perfect example, right to bear arms. Like, yes, absolutely. Have the right to bear arms. Cool. You live in Albania for about 10 years. Uh, Four altogether. Yeah. Have there ever been a mass shooting? Uh, Nope. Not Where that someone's gone into a school? No. Why do you think that is? Do, do they not all have weapons? <laughs> Have Whether weapons. they're legally or not, do yeah. they not have oh, guns? Oh yeah, all have weapons. Used Throughout to be a lot Kosovo more. Kosovo too. Used to be a you lot see in more. The weddings, they're boom, 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 right? Mm -hmm. So everyone has guns. And do a triple wedding. How come they don't have mass shootings if guns are the problem? Mm. If guns are the problem, can I tell you why? Mm. I believe there's something that people are taking in this country. I never realized how many people are addicted to Adderall. Mm. How many people are on Prozac? Mm. Okay, I think the answer is right in front of our faces, and nobody's talking about it, or the powers that be are so powerful. That no one talks about it. Mental health. When you look at the commercials online for like all these different drugs, if you're taking this and you're experiencing suicidal thoughts, it mm. says it in the commercial all right. that you could possibly be taking something that gives you suicidal thoughts. They don't have this culture of Adderall and Prozac. Yeah. Okay. And I'm not saying that there's not a use for these things once in a while. I believe the American people are abusing psychotropic drugs. Mm. Some of these people that are mentally disturbed are on these drugs, they have negative effects. Mm. Grab a gun, they go postal. I believe that every time there's one of these shootings, they need to take the blood of that person and what they are on should be made public. Mm. How this has not been done once with all these mass shootings yet, you want to come and infringe on something that has 
given us the freedom that spread not only from our nation to the rest of the world. We were the light. Mm. We've lost our way as a country. We are in trouble. My opinion. Yeah. Every time there's a mass shooting, there needs to be a toxicology report that is made public. I guarantee you there's a common denominator. Mm. I wonder how, I mean, because it- You like it, that theory? It's interesting. And I'd be, I'd be, I mean, I think the, the as much public knowledge about, about any of these events is great. You know, I, I think in terms of, of siloing knowledge, I think that, that uh, sunlight is the best disinfectant. And I think that uh, especially for, for enormously trans, uh, traumatic events in, in our nation, that the most transparency that we can possibly have, the better. And let's say let's say it leads to uh, saying, well, everybody's on potentially one psychotropic drug, right? So, or a family of sure. Let's they say altering the way people think. Let's say it's that. Um, you know, this is this is a fascinating thing to think about because then where do we track the problem to? So in in one respect, uh, it could be uh, pharmaceutical companies, right? And and what's a government's job in this case, right? The government's job is to limit negative externalities in a, a democratic capitalist environment. Well, you know that drug company is playing by the rules, right? If it's able to sort of push its, uh, and of course this is the the thought experiment. I'm not I'm not saying that that, but if that was something that uh, that we saw, that drug company would have been doing something completely legal. And if they have a lot of money being pumped into the lobby? Well, and this is the problem. And I think this is... this it's is kind of like the same thing the car companies do. They find out there's a defect. They mm. do their math. Well, and, and so this is... Is it cheaper to do yeah, a it's recall like, it's or a, let people die? Yeah, it's, it's like that scene in Fight Club. Right? It's like the, the actuarial uh, the actua yeah. uh, actuarial odds of, of death, basically. I've never realized how shallow, mm. how ignorant, how dumb, most people are until the whole thing that happened over the last three years happened with mm. our health and shutting everything down and just how easy everyone's just to let go of their freedom. I think as being someone that comes from a region that's been fighting for over 2,000 years mm. for its existence and to see what my family went through to get those rights and the lives that they gave up in real time to, to, to lose these people and to see my fellow Americans who have been here 10 generations, they don't realize what they have, man. Mm. They don't realize what they got, and they're just willing to let it go because they really don't know how dark it can be in other places in the world. You've been to some of the darkest places on this earth. Yeah. And what I mean by dark, I'm not talking about light. I'm talking about your life's in danger walking down the block. You don't know if you're going to have your next meal. Out of all the places you've been to, name some of the countries you've been to. You said you've been to how many countries? About 47, 47, 50, something like that. Where do you feel like the most dangerous place you've been to was? Um, it used to be the United States, but now it's Somalia, um, Northern Somalia, the, uh, the Republic of Somaliland, uh, that, that was definitely, um, yeah, I mean, and, and I should say, you know, Somaliland is, is, I think if you, you go there? uh, I was, uh, this was the research for my book, my book. Uh, it was the, it's the last place that I ended up, uh, was, uh, was the, the sort of independent portion of Somalia that's known as Somaliland. Uh, previously a British protectorate, uh, it was trying... So it's its own country? Or it's an autonomous region yeah. within Somalia? It's, a, it's an autonomous region within uh, Somalia, according, to, um, according ethnic, to Somalia. What ethnic group lives there? So uh, they are Somali, but the uh, the, the dominant uh, tribe there is the Isak tribe. Um, of course, there are other there are other tribes that that exist in the area. Somalis tend to be nomadic by nature, and so uh, it's, a, it's a tribal and clan-based system. Um, and you know, it, it, in, uh, towards the point about identity too, one of the things that I noticed with, uh, with some of the, uh, the Somali men that I was, uh, I was talking with in my time there at one point they said, uh, you know, most Somali men are able to name, or at least I, I was mostly talking to Isak men. So maybe this is different for, for other tribes, but they're able to name, um, you know, all of their, the names of their fathers back to Isak back to their, wow. their, you know, uh, patra, patrimonial lineage. So, I mean, I, I can name like, you know, my grandfather's name and my great grandfather's name and that's about it. But to have like, you know, them to just be able to recite 13 names until that's the furthest back they can track it. It's like, that's, that's the, the root level of identity and, and sort of back to your, your point about America. Um, and I think this is, it, it's something to, that I try to have empathy for 
when I come back to the States from, you know, wherever I've been, um, you know, obviously I've spent a, a lot of time in the Middle East in developing countries um, and also in Western Europe, right? And I think the important thing to have empathy for is the fact that it's very difficult to know the water that you're swimming in, right? You know, it's like the joke, uh, two, two, two fish, two young fish are swimming along. They run into an older fish. Older fish says, how's the water today, boys? Younger fish says, what's water? You know, we don't know how, how good it is, how nice it is to very, very simply to have uh, infrastructure that allows us to know when to cross the damn street. <laughs> I mean, you've crossed the road in Albania before. Like, it, it's just, it's, it's traffic You're jazz. Frogger. Frogger. Yeah, absolutely. You're playing Frogger. And somehow it works but like you know off, oftentimes it doesn't work um i don't know if you saw this recently i think it was last year um a bus and you know this is a, a f- hilarious thing about toronto but it is a wonderful city so everybody go visit it but uh this bus went off of the road and nobody was hurting it it crossed the lana river like perfectly it just sort of leapt off the road and then stopped in between the Lana River right next to the bridge there. And it basically became its own bus bridge, you know, in between the sides of the Lana River. And one of my friends launched like a change.com petition. And she said, like, keep the river bus as an architectural heritage of, of Tirana, Albania. And they left it for like six months or something like that. But it's like you you don't see that kind of negative externality, as I'm saying happen in london like you don't see that kind of thing um and and it certainly wouldn't be kept for like six months uh but everything's a trade-off right so with the the let's say the the freedom of of having very limited controls you also have the possibility of catastrophic accidents like that happening you know there are no solutions they're just trade-offs and so as countries develop They're navigating those trade-offs. Like, you know, in the States, one of the things that we we think about a lot is, and and sometimes I find it odd how people sort of look at at capitalism like a style of governance. Capitalism isn't necessarily a style of governance until capitalism pumps money into government, like you say, until money becomes free speech. Capitalism is, is a way of disseminating resources and if you disseminate resources that don't care about the borders that you're in suddenly we get a situation like we have now where we have in the united states anyway we have like this uh you know we have we have highly skilled thinkers and innovators that are able to export the labor to another country and so we get to send the negative externalities out to another country where it doesn't bother us so much, right? You know, we can create an iPhone and then have all the mining done in the Congo, right? And, and then suddenly, you know, wonder why, why the, uh, the, the world is having all of these, these other problems. Like capitalism and, and the, the rule of, of the dollar doesn't care about borders, And so as I was going through all of these different countries, one of the questions that I kept coming up with was, is it possible to separate the feeling of a national identity, the the impression of a national character from the wealth that that controls and from the military might that that controls? What does America look like if it, it doesn't have a dominant military? or an enormous amount of wealth. Is there just a feeling beyond that, or is your identity always connected to where your past was and what you might be able to do in the future? Because, you know, powerful countries like to say, well, our future is going to be this because we're going to maintain so much power. And I don't necessarily know if it's possible to separate a national character from the the wealth, the might, the uh, the economic uh, enfranchisement that it's provided to its people, or the lack of economic enfranchisement that it's provided to its people, it's hard to say. You've been to forty plus countries in the yeah. world. <clears throat> Where would you rank Albanian women as far as beauty? Well, I mean, and on a scale uh, of one to ten, ten being the most beautiful woman you've ever seen in your life. One is 
Run for the hills. I mean, I, it's definitely a 10 because there's a lot of Albanian women that'll murder me if I don't say that. I'm very afraid of them. We'll give you protection. <laughs> no, no Alba- honestly, honestly. Al- Albanian women are, are, are absolutely gorgeous. But but I think also on top of that, like, you know, some of my best friends are, are you know, most of my, my close friends in Albania are, are, are women. And... I mean, the the things that, that each of these women have done, it, it's astounding. Like I've I've seen I've seen people that are are facing some kind of economic disenfranchisement, maybe in the States or, or elsewhere, and they just kind of give up. But the the my friends have just this this constant sense of, well, you know, I'm going to make something happen for myself. And it's these, these women, like, um, I was talking, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm briefly unemployed while I'm, uh, I'm working on my book right now while I'm getting my book out. And, uh, my, my dear friend, uh, uh Miss she was, uh, uh, she was unemployed for, for a brief bit of time. And man, she was just knocking on every door and made like, and then by, you know, after a couple of months had like three jobs fighting for her. And I was like, I've never, you know, seen somebody just like with that amount of motivation. Like I said, you know, uh, uh, Lorena, uh, who who runs the uh, the first video game studio in Albania. Um, my friend Albana. Maybe the Albanians won't be the bad guys like in Grand Theft Auto. <laughs> I don't know if they are in Grand. I never I've never played yeah, they it. They are. My friend actually uh, did the voice for it. Oh, cool. Yeah. Sick. Shout out to Luan. Hey, Zeddy. Right on, man. He's an Albanian voice in Grand Theft Auto. Yeah. Hell yeah. So I uh, like yeah my my friend Alba- uh, Albana she came back from ten years abroad in Bulgaria and she's like you know I'm gonna start a, a paint and wine business I was talking to her uh, I mean about halfway like when she began the business like you know six months before and she was like yeah it's been less than a year and I'm you know I'm I'm in the black like I'm like and she's already moving up to a bigger space I'm like this is this is wild. Like, meanwhile, the, you know, folks in the States are like, well, I'm just sort of like resting on the laurels of my nice tech career. Like the the amount of of drive and motivation and humility, too, at the same time is is astounding. Like that's that's the thing that I find I find so consistently inspiring about the place that makes me, you know, and, and the women um, that makes me just be like, fuck, I got to work harder. <laughs> I got to. <laughs> Like, I got to do better. I always said, I think, if I could choose if I was born here or immigrated here, I'd rather have been the immigrant. Because mm. the drive that an immigrant has, I think so many of us that were born here were so spoiled, mm. so blessed, and we don't even see the opportunities we have. But these people from the outside, they see it. And, you know, that's the one thing I gathered from going back to visit Albania and the Republic of Kosovo during all those years um, was, I'm like, these people wish they had the chance that I have. I have to capitalize on it. I have to use this <clears throat> gift I was given, which is the American dream. Yeah. And I believe that, you know, America really needs to wake up and stop self-hating, and we need to find a way to coexist. I think the problem we're having right now is a clash of <clears throat> you know, lifestyles, right? So, you know, with all due respect to the transgender community, the LGBTQ you know, your lifestyle's there. <clears throat> You've been given your rights. You can get married. You can do all that, right? You're, you're equal as far as the government's concerned. Maybe people are mistreating you, whatever the case may be. I don't believe in hatred. I believe, you know, if we live in a country, we have to abide by what the society is allowing. Hmm. But there's a point where you start crossing borders and boundaries that I don't think anyone has a right. So you see, Islam is a way of life. It's not like just a really, like, no, like, I'm a Muslim, I pray five times a day, I don't eat pork, I don't drink, if I'm actually following the religion, a Christian, one lifestyle can no longer supersede the other. Meaning, <clears throat> you can't favor one over the other. We all have a right. That's how this country was founded, supposedly, and we all know we have a dark past too. But ideally, it was founded for religious freedom. Mm. And I feel like we're getting to a place now where people that are religious are not being shown the respect that other groups want themselves that fought very hard to get it, right? So I'm not knocking what they've been through, you know, hatred, being killed, all that stuff. But we're at a point now where these two are coming to a clash. Well, I think the... the I feel like the very fabric of America is being ripped to pieces. You know, if you want to give one month to celebrate one lifestyle, then, hey, why can't a Muslim have one month to celebrate Islam? Where do you draw the line? If you're giving one month to a lifestyle choice, we're not even talking about an ethnic group. 
talking about a lifestyle. Mm. Christianity is a lifestyle. Mm. This country was founded by Christians. Judaism is a lifestyle. Hinduism is a lifestyle. It's a life that people live. They live by these set of principles, regardless of borders and boundaries. So if you choose to live your life the way you do, and what you do in your bedroom is private. I don't care what you do. I don't care what your choices are. I don't care who you marry. But when you start to overstep those boundaries, now you're interfering with my lifestyle. And now I have a fucking, now we got a fucking problem. And that's where we're at right now. We're at a very dangerous precipice. And this is, I think, the greatest problem America's facing culturally right now, where hopefully we can kind of look at, like, outside. You know, you are, from the way I perceive you, someone that's lived abroad. You've seen many different ethnicities, groups, religions. You understand cultural conflict. And there's a lot to be said about that and where we are right now at this dangerous crossroad in American politics, history, lifestyle, culture. What do you see happening in the U.S. in the next 10 to 20 years? Do you think America's in trouble? I mean, wh what is your opinion with everything you've been able to gather? Because I don't think there's a greater education than the education of travel. Mm. Would you agree? Yeah, I mean, I, I have a lot of education in travel, so so I, I you know certainly yeah. benefits me between to say yes. Reading, um, reading a book about it and yeah. actually going there. I mean, I mean, I. What I, are your thoughts about what I just said? Well, I think that that you're so in. In one respect, you're you're touching on the sort of like uh, I think is Bertrand Russell's uh, idea of of freedom, right? So you're uh, you're as free as you want to swing your fist until it impacts on somebody else's face, right? And and in a uh, in a society that is ostensibly as free as possible, where we prioritize freedom, then we have to assume that there are going to be these cultural concept or cultural concepts that that clash with one another but at the same time i think that it's important to like notice how much it works and how it doesn't um how it doesn't breed sectarian violence constantly i mean that sectarian violence is is Oftentimes, if you look at, at you know global history, it's it's kind of the rule rather than the exception. And yet, I'm walking around. You know, this is I've been in New York for the last last couple of days, and I'm walking around. You know, just being overwhelmed by the city. I live in Toronto, so it's a pretty pretty tiny town. Forty five minutes to walk across the whole thing, and I'm listening to a million different languages spoken in the street. And I'm I'm seeing you know businesses that are representing businesses, restaurants you know, you name it, representing every lifestyle under the sun. And yet it's working, you know, and it's growing and people want to come here. It's, and, and I don't, I, I think a lot of that is, uh, I think a lot of that is, is, you know, hype and branding about New York City, but, which is great. But I think a lot of that is absolutely true. The fact that like when people come here, they're able to, make a life for themselves and, and establish part of their identity as being a New Yorker, not a American, not a, you know, Ghanaian, not an Albanian, but as a New Yorker. And because they're able to, to thrive in this pluralistic society and the society permits it, like that's, that's where, where greatness really comes in is that you have an identity that allows multiple points of view, multiple lifestyle and then you establish rules of the road so that everybody's able to get get along. You know, there's, uh, you know, the the nobody cares who's driving the subway, right? It's just that the subway is driving. Um, I think that that the United States has a uh, so in answer to your question about the U.S. I think that that within the national character of the U.S. there's there's a great deal of individualism individual self-determination and i think the flip side of that the shadow side of that is is oftentimes paranoia fear um but i also think that that people in the u.s rarely give themselves the credit for being able to intelligently connect with one another for being able to have conversations over the spin of the media and for being very accepting of other people. I always think like, you know, I trust individuals, definitely. Institutions, I trust less. You can, you can absolutely reason with an individual soldier, reasoning with an army, 
that's that's very different and it's probably not a great idea um you know you can talk to an individual police officer certainly but when the 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 rule of law and the institution of the law is behind them well you're not going to be able to connect on a personal level and so i think that individuals in the united states are able to overcome a great deal and we've done it before and and we've shown incredible innovation in the world that's that's a remarkable thing about us and we tend to as as you know people who are are you know in the dominant world power tend to think especially if the the dominant world power is in decline i mean granted there have been many dominant world powers before us it was the uk before them it was portugal before them it was spain um you know we can go back to the umayyad empire right uh, or the ayubed empire like you know pick an empire it's easy to feel paranoid and to feel cagey when you are not going to be on top in the future but i think it's also not necessarily intellectually fair to say that that when another country takes our place as or maybe we have a multipolar world that we will be treated as other country as we've treated other countries in the adventurism that we've had throughout the world history right um one because i don't think that's necessarily economically beneficial for anybody like it's not beneficial for uh a you know another world power to uh to to dominate us militarily because they still need us as consumers they still need us as workers right um the the united kingdom obviously like it was the sun never set on the british empire at a certain point like it didn't blow up and disappear the uk is still doing fine you know it's it has changed and and i think that there is a certain relief that should come with not being a, a dominant militaristic power anymore and i think that that strength will ultimately come from our ability our ability to lean on self-reliance our uh incredible natural resources i mean we have so much arable land we have so much navigable waterways we have so much land in general i think it was lincoln i, I mentioned this to, Dan, to danny you know he was uh at one point talking about uh how there's uh you know we have the Appalachian mountain range over here we've got the the Rockies over here this is not how Lincoln talk probably <laughs> um we've got you know these these enormous plains we've got so much land if the American empire is to well he wouldn't call it an empire but if if uh the American experiment is eventually to to go away it will be by suicide it won't be by another domination yeah, that's from, what i'm worried about I, I and i think it's good to be concerned but i think it's also uh, good to to take your fellow countrymen as reasonable you know and that's I hard mean, to do there's a lot of things that are kind of unreasonable right now but sure. we won't get into all that there's a lot of really weird shit going on bro <laughs> i think we can okay, both agree about that shit, yeah especially with children involved like i mean there's some fucking borders and boundaries that are being crossed right now, and I think there is going to be a pushback, and I don't have such an optimistic view as you do. Yeah. I believe I'm seeing the beginnings of what could lead to the destruction of this country mm. because you will have that clash of these two ways. Of, yeah, basically, the way I paint it, people that believe in God, people that <coughs> don't. That's basically what it comes down to. People that believe in God, people that don't. One lifestyle is not even accepted in spiritual sense, right? You know, if we're being real here and we're calling it for what it is. They have their rights, they have whatever. But now these people feel like they're trying to teach my kids this stuff. I'm religious. I don't want my kids learning this shit. I don't think it's going to go away quietly. I think we're on the precipice of major conflict in this country. So, I mean, look, I... And I, I that sounds crazy, but I'll, I'm willing to go on the record. I right. do not want that, nor am I calling for that. I'm just saying I think we're at a very dangerous crossroad. There's a lot of tension ethnically. Mm. There's a lot of te tension sexually. Mm-hmm between people's lifestyle choices. I don't even know why this needs to be a public debate anymore. Mm. We all have our rights. Move, keep it moving. Mm. Like, I don't want to know what you do. You don't want to know what I do. We all have the right to get married, get taxed. Like, let's just, like, move on with our lives now. And I think that that's the only way we can quiet down this chaos. Mm. I think it's becoming chaotic. I think people are getting very angry on different sides for different reasons. And I'm not saying who's right or wrong here. I'm just saying... I think, you know, no one ever had a, a, a crystal ball for how the future would look for our country, right? Yeah. It was an experiment, as you said. Right. 
Up until then, it was all monarchies and kings and dictators and whatever. So there's no denying what America has done for the world, leaving out a lot of things I think we did wrong, a lot of conflicts we didn't belong in. But we literally have seen the greatest pulling out of poverty across the globe for the most part compared to historical times. But there's still a lot of people that live in poverty in this world. Man. Certainly, yeah. Like, what is it, one out of five people don't even have, like, food, if I'm not mistaken, if that's the number. You know, the amount of children that die in poverty. Like, these are things that I think we should be focusing on rather more than what I'm doing in my bedroom. Mm. And to see money that we spend in wars all across the country, you know, the world, trillions of dollars when we have Americans in the streets, homeless, mental health crisis, dilapidated infrastructure. I mean, we can go on and on and on. The bottom line is what you've done, your research is fascinating. I think people are foolish if they don't buy your book. Hope so. I mean, no, no, not that they're um, foolish. <laughs> definitely want to get you back on in the future. Yeah, yeah. I'll send you a copy. Kind of been up to. You better send a copy. We'd like to support or even buy the copy. You guys can check that out here. There's the links. Put up your social media. I want to thank you for coming in. I want to thank Absolute you for, pleasure, for, yeah. for experiencing the Albanian experience. Sigurisht. And this is Eric Zulegger. This is a guy that's lived in 40 plus countries. He's got a very unique experience that I think we can learn a lot from. I'm sure you go into great detail in your book. And I think, you know, as an American to understand, I don't think we understand the outside world enough, especially if Americans that haven't traveled outside. They say most people don't travel how far from their home. Oh, I have, I have like probably a couple hundred miles, but yeah. I know a lot of Americans don't tend to have passports. Um, so like we need to know what's going on in the world. This is a guy that's lived in some of the most dangerous places in the world or perceived to be dangerous. And I think, you know, fear is always the unknown. And the fact that you've gone to some of these places and you can sell, especially with my own, you know, my Albanian ancestry, you know, we have this horrible reputation and it's like, why? Mm. There's a couple bad guys, you know, every culture has a couple criminals. The, the overall experience you had is very different than public perception. Would you agree? Yeah. And I, I mean, I think that goes back to everything that we've been talking about. It's like, you know, the, the, the loudest, the loudest minority is the one that gets platformed. And, and oftentimes that bears no resemblance to reality of the individual, you know, Eric Zulegger, check out his book. You are not here travels through countries that don't exist. You are not here travels through countries that do not exist. Pick up your copy. Amazon. Follow him, follow my guy. It's on Amazon. Follow him. Check him out. Send him a message. Let him know you saw him on Beck Lover Podcast. This is the Beck Lover Podcast where you might just learn a thing or two about life. Till the next time. Keep learning. Air Popsham. Tung tung.